no pawns. Um, oh man. Just, just, I'm just tired. I'm excited though with the new iPad. To, I have a whole lot of stuff That's I want to do with it. The only reason that you're excited is that you have a new iPad. I mean, it cost me a grand. I better damn well be excited about it. Well, my setup, well, I have older versions. So, yeah. but my setup only cost me $300. Well, but you split the cost with your with your parents. With my parents. Yeah. <laughs> I bought this all. I mean, my parents gave me $250. And that was it. So, you didn't spend all of it on your own. Well, I spent 750. But, like, that money was given to me and was mine. So I did spend a grand on it because they just gave me money. They just, For my birthday, they were just like, here's some money. It was $250. So I took the money, accumulated it with my own, and spent a grand on the iPad. But if they hadn't given you the money, you wouldn't have been able to get it. So they helped. Well, no, I still would have been able to get it. it. If they hadn't given me the money, I still would have gotten it. Oh, okay. I would have. I was gonna get it either way. You have a thousand dollars lying around. I I did. <laughs> <laughs> Don't anymore. <laughs> That's okay. how this works. Um, I've been trying to come up with like a tagline for the show, so it's like media for the intellectually impoverished. The podcast about the podcast to enrich your four dummies by dummies. <laughs> what? Four, four dummies, dummies by, by dummies. dummies. <laughs> <laughs> no, not but yeah. We are dummies. We are dummies. Kind of. Um, I tried to talk to you about this this morning, but you you are on a different page. What do you mean? Remember when we had lunch? Yeah. Yeah, I was trying to talk to whatever. Doesn't matter. Like our our pre our pre podcast meeting. Yeah. So you did lunch. You could have just brought it up. I, I mean, tried to, but I I don't think you caught on. But I don't know. I, either you didn't. I didn't say it right, or you didn't listen or something happened or miscommunication i don't think you said it at all because we were talking about the purpose of the podcast you never well, yeah, brought up but a no, slogan but that's kind of what i oh meant. No, no no you did oh i get it i got it now yeah you did bring it up now I did Oops. um well i guess you know what is the purpose of the podcast to, in your eyes what are, what are you wanting to do with this what is it like use this platform for like you said like just to like talk about nerd stuff talk about movies and video games i mean you you're looking at it more from the standpoint of like going deeper into them and educating people yeah but it's not like i don't want it to sound like people are that are going to listen to have to be like really smart people who because i mean i know we called it media for the intellectually impoverished we, we, we had a big appetite when we <laughs> <called it> that. <laughs> um but no i don't want people to come into this thinking like oh they're just going to be really boring talkers about boring media stuff and it's just not I, like i want to have fun i want it to be like an like a like an enjoyable ride i don't want people to just be like "Ugh, these guys are talking and i don't care mm -hmm. does that make any sense yeah it's going to be hard to find that line. I yeah, I mean, we'll find it eventually. Yeah. I want to take this as an outlet to to talk about things that I'm really interested in that I hope that I can interest other people in and, like, why I'm interested in it. <gasps> that's my mom's calling. you. That's me. I, it's my mommy. Let's all listen in very quickly. Hey, Mom, you're on speaker. I'm recording a podcast. What's up? Oh, sorry. Um, I accidentally called you. I didn't mean to. And it's my mom. I did have a good day. Um, yeah, it was a good day. I've been doing a lot of homework and uh, getting ready for the, you know, the recording today. Okay. The recording that you're making right now that we're interrupting, that one? That's the one, yeah. Cool. Okay, well then, have a nice day. Did all right. Did you eat all the cookies that made you? I haven't eaten all the cookies yet, no. Um, <laughs> I still have a bunch because some of my friends were planning to get together and then I, now I guess we're not. Um, and so I just was waiting for them to get together so we could have cookies. Okay, but, well, don't edit this part out of the podcast. It makes it very real. Okay, yeah. All right, love you. Sorry, love you too. Bye. bye. My parents, ladies and gentlemen. I love your parents. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, what were we talking about? Slogans. Yeah. I Whatever. We'll come up with one later. We're not going to do it now. I don't know. We're we, not going to keep I, We do that. It's, it's already been 10 minutes. 10 minutes? <laughs> like, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, this is Media for the Intellectually Impoverished, um, slogan inserted here. I'm Taylor, I'm Trey Taylor Smith, um, go by Taylor, people call me. And I'm your co-host, Randy. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, and together we are Taylor and Randy. Um, so yeah, last week we talked about like indie films, indie games, and just sort of that general vibe, and we sort of came up with this idea of uh, how, the, what would you say, the general theme was that being an indie developer gives you leeway to talk about like darker, deeper theme- themes Mm-hmm. Or these parts that are bugging you about society that you don't necessarily get a chance to exactly uh, in mainstream or AAA kind of uh, blockbuster areas. Mm-hmm. Um, so this week we're taking the opposite look. We're looking at the AAA games, the blockbuster movies, and we're gonna sort of take a deep dive into those this week and talk about uh, the, the you know what goes on there behind the scenes a little bit. Um, and what makes these games AAA games? Why uh, these movies are blockbuster movies, and what does that mean? And how does that affect the movie and the game itself? So, you want to start us off? What you got? Sure, I'll start us off. So, I'm really excited because I get to talk about my favorite thing in the world, which is Disney. Heck yeah! Because they're a freaking <laughs> monopoly, and they own everything. Every they don't what? So they've got like Nat Geo. They've got. Um, uh, obviously, like Disney and all their children's shows, and they've got uh, Marvel. They've Marvel, got Star Wars. They got Star Wars. Now they have Fox, right? I believe they so. just purchased Fox because The Simpsons is on yes. Disney Plus, and I watch that. Like, mm-hmm. It's awesome. Have you watched any? And of on Simpsons? Disney Plus, they also have um, National Geographic. That's what I see. Yeah, Nat Geo. Yeah, and Pixar, but they've had Pixar for a while. Yeah, now. Pixar is sort of just associated. They've had that since the nineties. Mm-hmm. So. Um, Yes, yeah. but I'm very excited. Um, so I wanted to talk about some of the, the newest movies that they've come out with, a lot of their remakes of the older animated movies. And this is something that we see with a lot of blockbuster movies or that I've noticed or that you can say. Well, first off, let me say this. So for the studio system, before I dive into Disney, there are six major studios that basically bring out like all of the movies that we see. That is Disney, Warner Brothers, Columbia, Universal Studios, 20th Century Fox, and Paramount. And so these are the studios that have all the movies that we basically see. There's still a few other ones that are sprinkled in, but these are like the main ones that basically own everything. Yeah, that's like the the big ones. And some of those smaller ones might be like subsidiaries Mm -hmm. of the bigger ones too. So yeah. Exactly. Like Marvel Studios, like we said, that's a part of Disney. Um I, I knew oh like um DC films and Warner Brothers like they yeah Warner yeah Brothers. yeah anyways okay so I first wanted to talk about the remakes and how they're not all great I mean that's yeah. basically what I feel like blockbusters are at this point it's all and you hear you hear this from everyone I feel like especially like cinema people that all of the movies out today are just remakes or they're What's the other word that I'm looking for? They're just rehashing the rehashings. same ideas. Yeah, there, there, there's no original ideas anymore. It feels like, and the original ideas that do come out aren't great. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of the the problem, isn't it? Is that like what people fail to realize is that when you spend all your time remaking things that were good for nostalgic purposes, mm-hmm. um, and you're not creating this new content, then you're not getting the saturation of well made well put forth um content uh that brings out sort of like the the citizen canes of the cinema world and yeah. the um just the, the bigger movies and the the more like uh more i don't know how to put it like satisfying story wise and thematically yeah um so a lot of movies that like were, that are coming out that i feel like are kind of nail in the head right now or like netflix originals um, yeah. Hulu, orig- they're all originals to these streaming services mm-hmm. and not necessarily big blockbuster box office hits. Yeah, and a lot of those are really good. That, And I see a lot of people flocking to those more. I know when they first started happening, people didn't like them. Like Netflix, it was becoming its own thing and it was having, like it has so many Netflix originals now and when that first started happening, people didn't like it because they wanted those blockbuster movies on there. They didn't want to see what Netflix had to offer, what Hulu wanted to have to offer, but now I definitely see people leaning more towards that. Anyways, with Disney, I wanted to talk about some of their good remakes and some of their bad ones. So first off, just briefly, because I have one main one that I want to talk about. Um, They first started making remakes in about 2015, I want to say. I would say their first one was Cinderella. Was it? 
See, people argue that it's Maleficent, and I don't know if you would count Maleficent as a remake. That's true, because it's not necessarily the same story. It's, it's, it's really not. It's really taking it on its head and looking at it from this different perspective. Um, I saw Maleficent. When did that come out? Do you know? No. No? Um, so probably 2013. 13, 14. Because I, I was be, young when yeah. I saw it. Um, and, like, I just remember being like, oh, cool cool maleficent and live it was sort of this first experience of seeing these animated characters live action that wasn't um like a a youtube fan video or just a a play or something Mm -hmm. and so it is a unique experience seeing those characters portrayed like on the big screen live action but yeah yeah. and to have it done so well because like you were saying like other people have tried to do like remakes live action versions like but small productions and things like that but to see disney actually making these remakes was a big thing and i wouldn't count maleficent as a remake because it does take the other side of sleeping beauty and comes up with a completely original story i mean sleeping beauty in it or briar rose i think is the actual name of the character um is seen very little throughout the movie, I want to say. Well, I mean, you know, the titular character is Maleficent yeah. for that one, so it does make sense. Yeah. Um, but Cinderella, I would consider that one the first one came out in 2015, was directed by Kenneth. I'm not going to say his last name you're right. Not? Just, just, oh, you're not going to say it right. I thought you were going to say you're not going to say it. So I'm like, are no, we just going to talk about Kenneth? Kenneth, <laughs> just, <laughs> Kenneth my, my man. <laughs> um, Brano? It's Irish, and I don't, the, the way that it. I, How is it spelled? B R A N A G H. No, it's probably Brunel. 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 Okay. Um, anyways, he. Sorry, would... Kenneth. <laughs> Sorry, Kenneth, my man. Love ya. <laughs> no, Cinderella was actually really good. I thought so. Um, it doesn't. It took the same storyline, obviously. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't be a, a Cinderella movie without the same basic storyline of she, like, is a, a, a poor. Not poor, but she has these evil stepmother and stepsisters, and then she wants to go to the ball and she loses her slipper, and then the prince like tries on the slipper with everyone. Basic idea. They took out a lot of the, the music and the singing of it, and they did go deeper into the characters. They went deeper into Cinderella's backstory and deeper into the prince's backstory, which I think is what made it a good film. It sticked originally to the main idea, but it went deeper. And then also Beauty and the Beast came out in 2017, was directed by Bill Condon. Condon? I don't know. I'm sorry, Bill. Bill, my man. (laughs) Bill, my man. Bill, Bill, my my man. man. Love that one as well. This one, a different take. It's basically the same idea, but again, it goes deeper into the backstories of the character. It goes deeper into Belle's backstory about how she lost her mother, why her father is a lone, like, inventor and how they got to this place, and it goes deeper into the Beast's story about how he was so full of himself and he threw these lavish parties and was all about wealth and power in these things and how he lost that and his growth. I mean, especially because when you think of the old animated movies, they were only about a little over an hour Mm -hmm. so they had to like cram everything in and they couldn't go into these deep backstories but with these new animated movies there's they're long almost two hours new new live action live action i say animated animated. live action movies sorry remakes um are longer and so they do have that ability to dive deeper into the characters and also because they're big studio systems or disney disney has the money to do this yeah and that was um that was bigger to, well, you know, I think what came up before that was the Jungle Book, right? Yes, I have the Jungle Book written down they were, as well. The, but the the first one to include music again was the Beauty and the Beast one. I, I believe so. That was the first no, one. No, 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 no. Jungle Book had music. I had original see, I didn't, music. I didn't see the the. That oh, you one. didn't see. Okay, um, no, it had some of the original music. Definitely not as much, but had some of the original music yeah, in it. Yeah, so that one came out. And they also did like a Tarzan remake. Do you remember that? They I totally. Do not it was. It, I'm, I'm pretty sure they made one or two. It was like the Heart of Tarzan, and the only reason I know this is because Hozier wrote a song for it, and that was on in the trailer. Was Hozier? I remember. I'm I'm 100 percent positive they did that, and they did Pete's Dragon, which blew my mind because like why Pete's Dragon? Yeah, that's so random. No, I okay. Maybe I don't know as much about Disney as I thought I did. <sighs> well, I'm blowing your mind over no, here. No, seriously, you're <laughs> blowing my mind. I have yeah. to go find these movies now. Oh yeah, they're probably not on Disney Plus yet, but they. No, everything's on Disney Are Plus. You sure? Are you kidding me? I don't know Wait, about the are Tarzan these one. New movies they're not that are new. Coming out? These came out in the past. Like they came out in the past five six years. Um, then they would be on disney plus 
everything's on Disney Plus. Well, I mean, then go look for it. I'll go watch it. it. I'll find it. Um, but yeah, Don't so worry. the Beauty and the Beast was was big because of the 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 music, and they wrote a new original song. Yes. For the just for the movie. Many, and there wasn't just one. There was multiple new original songs multiple? in it. Um, my favorite new one was Evermore, a that song was, that Beast got to yes. sing. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, I remember my mom and dad, who we heard earlier, <laughs> um, definitely sang that one. My dad's like was studied music and was a singer, like a vocal performance major here. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, you would sing that song a lot in the car. <laughs> oh so no! Much. After I first so saw the movie, I didn't see the movie when it first came out. I'm always very hesitant when new Disney movies come out because I've been burned in the past. Can, can I ask how? What do you mean? Which one burned you? A lot of them burned Which me. Which ones? You got to give me specifics. I got to give you specifics. Okay. I mean Aladdin. I'm sorry, Aladdin's not. No, I love that one. It's I mean, not... I guess I'm by it. like the original or the remake. The remake. I'm talking See, about... Will I Smith. love all of the original animated movies. No, I will die for all of the original animated movies. I have them all on VHS at my house. I still have a VCR, and I still watch them. That is that is some dedication. Yes. Uh, you didn't like Will Smith as a genie? No? See, what I, what I appreciated about that take of Aladdin, personally, was um, that they didn't try to recreate Robin Williams. Well, yeah. Okay, I have to. Yeah. So yeah. it was. It was very much like Will Smith was doing a Will Smith thing and is his own version of the genie, which um, gave off a different vibe, um, which I did appreciate. Um, but yeah, well, let's let's get back. Let's get back on track. No, 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 no. I mean, it's it's good. Yeah, I just didn't really like Aladdin. I didn't really like The Lion King. Um, yeah. I felt The Lion King was too much on the nose. I feel like when you make these remakes, you have to go deeper into these characters. You have to bring something more to the table. And I feel like Lion King was just a bit too much. Just It, a, it was just like almost shot for shot, shot kind of thing? Yeah, it was just yeah. shot for shot. One kind of, thing yeah. that I will say about The Lion King, though, is one of the big pushes for using it, the director was Favreau, right? Yes. Um, John Favreau, who is huge in the sort of digital filming industry right now yeah for what he's designed and what he's directed um and his work with the lion king was sort of more of i wouldn't say more of a tech showcase but it was definitely like leaning towards this sort of like newer tech that he used and allowed him to sort of springboard off of that into like i think he he did the mandalorian Mm-hmm. as well yes um and so like his work on the lion king sort of w- led to his work on the mandalorian and mm-hmm. what he did and if you haven't heard of what he's done on the mandalorian i'm sure we'll talk about it at some point yeah um because it's insane he's but... done a lot no he's he did um the lion king he did jungle book as well directed jungle, jungle book. book yep mm-hmm. mandalorian he's yeah very that's his niche that's what yeah. he does um but it's what all those things really have in common is just sort of the the level of detail into his animation and his his work um just graphically and visually i think are just it's just astounding because mm-hmm. um, those lines look photo real oh no they looked very real and i think that was also see it's hard to explain and i would need to really go and watch the movie side by side because i know a big thing that people really didn't like about the lion king that i couldn't i don't really complain much about was that the emotion in the the animals you couldn't really see any like you when they were really sad or like because animals don't don't show yeah emotion. they don't show emotion in typical ways but whereas in the animated version like it's very clear because they're able to sort of play with that like the fact that it's not a real animal and they're mm-hmm. able to play with its dimensions and its face in a way that a real animal couldn't to show emotion in a human way yeah, but people were bashing the Lion King for that, for them not being able to, like, show emotion great. And then I, I don't remember hearing anything about that in the Jungle Book, because the Jungle Book's basically the same premise. All of the, everyone's just uh, CGI put in, like, and I, the, I didn't, maybe I, I wasn't paying in the, attention to paying it attention, I guess, but I didn't hear any complaints about that. And I think the difference between them is, um, I mean, I, and I haven't seen the Jungle Book, but it's probably because there is a, a human element 
in the jungle book you're right um and there is there is that human element and so it's not solely based off of these anim- anthropomorphized ideas of mm-hmm. you needing an animal to get this sort of emotion out of it um so that that could be a factor in it as well but it also could have been that people just didn't care as much because mm-hmm. the jungle book is amazing the original jungle book amazing yeah it is definitely a classic and it's it's a favorite among many but i think the lion king holds a, a different place in people's hearts, hearts than, the, yeah. than the jungle book mm-hmm. um and i feel like it's got a bigger following than the jungle book did just yeah. because of the the timing in which it was released it was later and you know it's very nostalgic for 90s kids yes um and so all these yeah. 90s kids come back and they see this movie and it's like basically shot for shot but just photorealistic mm-hmm. and it's feels kind of flat emotionally yeah i can see how people would be upset by that Mm -hmm. yeah and then the the last one that i wanted to talk about was mulan which i have not seen yet um my parents for some weird reason purchased the movie on top of a subscription to disney plus so but i don't understand well i understand the business business tactics behind that being like hey we're already charging people for this subscription but we need to get money off of this movie as well, and we figure an entire family's going to be watching it, so let's charge them, it was like 30 bucks. 30 bucks to watch 30 it, bucks yeah. on top of the, what, 10 per month, about... $8. $8, yes, so, you know, $8 per month. So <laughs> the, the amount of money that they're racking up from that, and just because it's, it's a remake of another classic movie that mm-hmm. 90s kids are like, oh, Mulan, everyone's seen Mulan. Exactly. Um, and so, and what what do you want to talk about? Like, well, I just, I didn't like it. I mean, I saw it with my friends because, like you said, like the reason they make it so expensive, which I didn't get at first. I was like, why would I pay $30 when, like, if we were going into a theater, I would pay like $10 to see it. But it's because so many people can watch. And so I watched it with my friends, Linda and Alyssa, and we did not like it as fans of the original Mulan we did not like it it changed it way too much you want it to be the same but you also want it to be a bit different when you go into it like with the Lion King you don't want it to be want it to be shot for shot but you also don't want it to be completely off base which is what I felt like Mulan was it wasn't funny I mean there wasn't it, it took a lot of the the characters that I found funny out of it they took Mushu out of it <gasps> they took the the little cricket out of it what? yeah there that I mean like and that was like the lifeline of the original Mulan, like yeah, they were they were like very much the comedic relief sort of um, third act, third not third act but like third group. Yeah. So like you know you've got the main group and then you've got this side group, so it's like Mulan herself and then maybe like the bad guy and then mm-hmm. there's the Mushu antics. Yeah. And so um, it was just that very much the comedy of it was very much based on how eddie murphy played this yes, character just, the, the lines the such quotable lines that i still use to this day just in random conversations because they're just so good and they're mm-hmm. so funny um but they took that out and then so you've seen original mulan yeah, yeah. so you know um oh what's the bad guy's name i can't remember i couldn't i just remember the mongols they're the yeah mongols. you know but he had a little he um, had the hawk the hawk took the hawk out what a real person now wait so the hawk is like a it's not an it's not like a, a so, CGI. But, so there's no there's no hawk. There's no hawk. Like at all. No. So he just has like a like a mistress. Kind of. It's a sh- he. Has, there's a shape shifting witch that oh. like takes the place. Okay. And so it's it's very strange. And so when you're watching it, this witch almost should be like the main antagonist of the movie because she just she has so many interactions with Mulan mm-hmm. and like tries to stop her and tries to. Because, you know, Mulan, she pretends to be a man in the army and she tries to out her and, like, let see make people see that she's a, a woman, woman so she can be killed and all of these things. Um, I don't want to spoil the movie, but there is... Oh, we can talk about it later, but there is a point in the movie where it's getting real, real serious and the two of them are real, real close together. Their faces right next to each other and you almost you just want them to kiss. <laughs> you just want them... <laughs> you, you fight, fight, fight. Keys. Keys. Now keys. <laughs> now keys. Yeah. Um, Would you say that there is, so we said that Lion King was too on the nose. Yeah. Right? Too much just the same movie with upgraded graphics. Yeah. Mulan was way off base. Mm-hmm. Is there a remake that you think toes the line just right? Yeah. I think Beauty and the Beast did great. 
because they, like we were saying before, they came in, they gave deeper backgrounds. They kept these hilarious characters like LeFou, um, Gaston's um, mm -hmm. little servant. Um, and they made the characters deeper and you really like resonated with them more. And you really cared for the beast more. And I had to compare them. I, a while ago, I had to compare the animated to the new remake just to see how big of a difference. It's huge. When you watch the original animated one, the Beast takes a complete 180 for no reason. He's he's mad at Belle. He wants her to like just love him and just be with him and all these things. And then she cleans his wounds when he gets attacked and then he's like oh i'm going to be nice to her and it's and we're going to she likes me now and all these complete 180 Which, in his attitude yeah but when you watch the movie for the first time it doesn't feel like that big of a 180 yeah, I guess and maybe you're it's right. just like you're because comp you're comparing it to this like remake, which goes way more in depth. Way more. They have a lot more interactions between, but after he gets attacked and before he becomes like this really like lovable character, you really see that arc, that that change in him, rather than just the animated. But I get that the animated is also angled towards kids. It's for kids, and yeah. so kids aren't going to be thinking of it like that. But with these remakes, that's the other thing about these remakes and why they keep making them is because they are now geared towards. Those same kids that watched them, like you were saying, it's nostalgic. It's for those 90s kids who used to watch them when they were little. And that's, I mean, and that's why they're going to keep making them. Some yeah. of them are going to be bad, but they're just going to keep making them because they know that they're going to make money. Let's, if we're going to talk about Disney, can we talk about Frozen and Frozen 2 for a minute? Yeah, go ahead. So Frozen 2 was developed in eight months. Really? From an animation standpoint, mm -hmm. that is almost logistically impossible. For an hour and a half movie yeah. to be made in eight months. If you look at the concept art for the Frozen and Frozen 2, mm -hmm. it's drastically different than what the final output was. If you look in the original storyline of Frozen, Elsa was supposed to be the villain. Yeah. Um, and they scrapped it because it, quote, didn't make sense. But that movie was developed, I believe, in a year and a half's time. I don't have the actual number here. But, um, and while that m part may be more true, I think that they'd had such grand ideas for Frozen 2 that they were unable to logistically create and animate within this eight month time frame of shooting the movie out yeah. before their, their due date. Um, and it's just because, and no docs to Disney, um, but they're just focusing on like the more money aspect. No, right they're now. definitely, that's the whole reason. Frozen, I, I say this about any new f movie that comes out, because Disney, the recent movies that have been coming out are absolutely great. If we go back, Frozen, original Frozen, Coco, uh, Moana, if we're going all back, those are all perfect standalone movies. Frozen did so well, and they're like, we gotta bleed this dry. And so they had to make a second one. It would have been fine where they left it. It didn't need a second one. I don't know if they had originally planned for it. Because, you know, some movies they plan, they're like, yeah. oh, we're going to have, like, three of these because we, we have this big story that we want to tell. I don't think Frozen was like that. I think they really did it because it was such a big hit. Yeah, and it was like they waited until the sales for Frozen items would go down. Went down. And then mm -hmm. once they went down, they were like, hey, what if we, like, made a Frozen 2? And then all this extra merch that we have from Frozen 1 will fly off the shelves yep. and we can make all this extra stuff for Frozen 2 and sell all that. Exactly. And... And they yeah. they were too ambitious. They and I, I get it. <laughs> Did you hit your elbow? No, I got a cramp in my arm for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> what you saw, I was doing nothing. I thought you like whacked your elbow <laughs> against something. Wow, that um, your body just hates you. I don't have enough potassium. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but oh shit, it's because I keep doing this, and then it must have like just clenched up. Anyways, um. They 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 were too ambitious, and I get the they they made the decision to have a second one, and so that was their decision. And then with that came the responsibility of topping the first Frozen, which is such an insane thing to do. And they honestly they fell short. I feel like they did. Yeah, yeah. I don't think Frozen One was amazing, and Frozen Two is just okay. Yeah, it's fine. It's just a good movie. Mm -hmm. It's not like a bad it's not a bad movie by any stretch i think it's an entertaining movie 
Um, I definitely laughed at all the jokes and I definitely enjoyed all the music. Mm -hmm. Um, I just think that it was was great. Yeah. Yeah. And they didn't expect, I forget. I can't in my mind. What's the end of the unknown. That was the, they weren't planning for that to be like the big song. I feel like that's the big song that came out of frozen Two. like Mm -hmm. let it go came out of the original. I don't know. I feel like they did plan that to be the big song because they had panic at the discos, Brendan Urie cover the song for the for, for the was that before it came out or was that after it that came was out? that was during the credits of the movie oh okay so i feel like that might have been the big selling song i was under the impression that the other song which i don't even know the name of when she's running through like she finally gets to that place and she sees her mom and all the crystals and stuff do you know what i'm talking about i know what you're talking about that song that she's singing i thought that was i was under the impression that was supposed to be like the big main song you know like let it go was this big like she was coming into her own and everything so they tried to like recreate that with her finally figuring out her history and like Mm. all of these things and she realizes what to do and what she's done wrong and Mm -hmm. now she's got to save the world yeah exactly um yeah well i'm gonna take it this sort of idea of um rehashing things and stare at my ipad until it opens up i just want to say two quick things about frozen didn't like Kristoff's storyline in frozen 2 in frozen 2 you didn't Didn't like like it oh i thought it was great Because, like, I've felt that before where it's been like, I just want to tell this girl something that's really important to me, and I keep screwing everything up. No, no, no. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, he keeps keeps screwing up. But the thing is, he has this whole ballad about, like, um, should I, like be with you? Like, should I, like, marry you? Lost in the Woods? Lost in the Woods, yeah. Oh, I thought it was, I thought the ballad was comedically hilarious because it it was, just because it was, like, an 80s ballad and... I don't know. I just thought it was really funny. It was great, but I'm just saying, like, if you really listen to it and what taking it from a deeper standpoint about what he's saying, he's already said that he wants to marry her. We already know this at this point. And now, because she's left without him, because she's gone off and done something on her own, like an independent woman, he's like, should I marry her? She keeps leaving me. I don't know if I should marry her. And then immediately when she comes back, he's like, I'm gonna marry her. What? What? Just... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like seriously watch it again and just look at what he's singing and then what happens as soon as she comes back he's like okay i'm gonna marry her it's like i'll be honest i, di- I didn't give it a second watch because it was just a good a movie <laughs> should i no it's okay take my <laughs> word for it that his storyline it really bugged me and i didn't like olaf being like the like the the jesus jesus yeah because he like dies and comes back to life oh no i just mean his his character he was no longer that like love lovable fun like snowman he was like so like i want to say like breaking the fourth wall almost but he wasn't he was like he was he was spouting off all of these like random facts and he was being like the he was smart now he had like a brain now he wasn't just like this goofball that just came into the world and was finding his own i didn't like that for him but i get that that's the character that the kids like like watch the most and love the most and so this was their chance for disney to be like let's make it a little bit smarter let them learn yeah, something yeah teach the kids things teach the kids something but um, yeah yeah so we were talking about like games that or sequels that don't measure up and sort of squeezing out all of this um uh stuff from one series or one idea um and let's move on to just sort of triple a games right and that is the the term that gamers, we gamers use um, to describe the equivalent of a blockbuster movie in the gaming world. Okay. Um, a, it's not a formal classification. Um, it, it generally talks about games that use like huge budgets or they have backing from a, a big studio. Um, so you said at the beginning your main studios that – are sort of like top in the games right now mm-hmm. uh, were those movie studios. Um, I didn't, you know, look these up, but off the top of my head, these are the ones that I came up with, and it was like Naughty Dog, Rockstar, Nintendo, Sony, Activision, and uh, Electronic Arts, which is EA. Yeah, and you know that those are the top ones because I know all of those. Yeah. And I am i don't play video games. Yeah, yeah. And so those are sort of the, the big guys in the, in the gaming industry right now. One of the big things that I sort of realize is it's literally defined uh, by having a, a bigger budget, okay. right? And so with a bigger budget in the gaming industry, that allows you to take more technological leaps, okay. right? But, but it also gives you this idea of like, we got to get returns, 
right? So they're they're shoveling out games. EA Sports is a big contender for that, just shoveling out the same game every year, but marketing it as new and original or something's up, but it's really just kind of like graphically better. Mm -hmm. um, and so games like that focus a lot of their budget into making it look as pretty as possible rather than playing completely different, you know, mm -hmm. like the Madden games or the FIFA games or the NBA games. Um, and so I feel like those are just like the Frozen movies or like these remakes are just, just dry of dry. any sort of originality. They've sort of been including microtransactions into those kinds of games. No. So, which was typically something you only saw in like a mobile game, but they moved it over to these uh, like FIFA games and you can get these special player cards and if you unlock these player cards, um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't play FIFA, money. but it's just for, it's just for money. Yeah. And they're just, just like, it, money. it makes money every year. So we're going to keep releasing it every year until it stops making money. And then we'll try it again when people forget about it. In a different aspect, right? We have these games that are just, that are series, right? But aren't sort of dry where they, they take this big budget and they use it to their advantage. And one or two series that I really think do that well. Um, it's like the God of War series um, and the Uncharted series, which is uh -huh. God of War was is done by... Um, the, the newest 2018 installment was Santa Monica SIE. Um, Uncharted is a Naughty Dog production. Uh, Uncharted 4 coming out in 2016. Um, so those two games specifically were released extremely not extremely, but much later than their predecessors. So the first three God of War games were on the PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 3. Okay. Right, you have God of War 1, 2, and 3, and it's a story about this guy who is Spartan, whose family is killed by, like, the gods, and he makes a deal with Hades um, to go and ki literally just kill all of the gods in, in revenge. And he does it. Over the course of three games, you kill every single god in Greek mythos. Um, as well as a few of the titans in Greek, myth Greek mythos. And so after that, everyone was like, ah, oh, we're satisfied, game is done, cool. Well, little did we know, they had been planning a, like a sequel series to this original series that takes place in the Norse mythology. Oh, okay. Right? And so like six or seven years after the God of War 3 comes out, they dropped this teaser trailer of Kratos, with a beard and so that's weird because when we saw him he was like clean shaven he's got this really distinctly white and red face paint um and like body color and um he's got this big old beard and he's got a small boy uh yes now you know what i'm talking about i know exactly what yes. you're talking about um and so they released this sequel to it um named just god of war uh and it is phenomenal. What they did with this this bigger budget from the predecessors, they took it and they funneled it all into this just technologically pleasing and aesthetically pleasing game, um, which is ripe with Norse mythology, Norse lore, and extremely beautiful gameplay. <laughs> so originally the God of War games were a fixed camera. So the camera is, is sort of like behind the character and it follows him and it's this third person way above the head point of view and it's just hack and slash you just killing things and getting experience points and upgrading your character and then becoming a god killer um well in god of war the remake uh you rather than use these cool bladed chain blade things right you would throw them and they would slice up people and then you'd come back and they'd just be these blades you get an axe you, you just get an axe just and an axe. <laughs> in the the core mechanic of the game is just throwing your axe at people and then it flying back to your hand. And they spent literal months just on that mechanic and making it feel correct. So the, the nuance of the motion that he's throwing it at and the angle that the axe is thrown, the different types of throws that you can have. You can have a quick throw, which he just sort of tosses it and it goes one way. Or you can have a heavy throw where he charges it and throws it. And then the retrieval of the axe. So it doesn't just come back it doesn't just like appear mm -hmm. it actually carves a path through other enemies um in a direct line 
back to his hand in which when it lands it sort of like shakes and the entire camera shakes and the controller shakes and it's just very aesthetic aesthetically just like it's it's so so pleasing and it's so fun and it's just so nuanced and the detail that goes into it is just great and it's stuff like that that sort of sets it apart from these games like fifa or the other trilogies or other remakes of games that um that that don't put this sort of like level of intention and then aren't just in it for the money Mm -hmm. like these guys are definitely in it to please their fan base and to please and give um the people like something worthwhile yeah um another example when i talked about uncharted 4 um there wasn't a huge bound in that game per se i would say the biggest thing that they did is they upped the size of the maps so uncharted is basically a playable indiana jones mm-hmm. um it's that sort of played uncharted. you have i played the first one i got through like half of the fourth one i skipped two and three <laughs> yeah well some would say those are the two best but the i'm someone, sorry someone oh, would say, i thought you meant you would say they were the two best i would say they are the two best uh, okay then i mean no, not, I not really i think my best. favorite is the second one and then it goes it's like two four three one which is really oh, supposed to be bombastic oh you didn't like the first one at all I, it's not that i didn't like it it's, it's that i didn't like it <laughs> it's that I didn't like it. um well i also played it after playing the two and three okay so i i first bought three and i was like oh this is really cool and then i was like like when i got a ps4 they re- released it with like the uncharted collection you could get a playstation that came with all three games on one disc and i was like whoa that's amazing hand me that right now mm-hmm. take my money um and so that's what I got, and then I played through the first two and replayed the third, and I was like, wow, this is really good. <laughs> and then my brother got the fourth one the next year, and I played it, and I was like, whoa! Um, so that also had a pretty, not a he- as big as God of War, but it's still a pretty big bound from between the release of the third one and the drop of the fourth one. Mm-hmm. Um, and logistics-wise, like game dev-wise, there's not a whole lot that I can say off the top of my head that is way cooler or more technical about the game, you know, mm-hmm. in the same sense that God of War had the axe instead of, and it changed the camera angle and it did all these crazy things with the, the playability and the play style of the game. Uncharted 4 plays pretty much the same. Uh, the major differences being just the the grandeur and the scale of which these the the levels are fleshed out and the world is fleshed out because uh, uh, one of the things that you do in uncharted is as you play through the game you go and you collect these little treasures um and these treasures if you collect all of them you get an award and they're like cool you spent way too much time playing our video game um but they also have in uh in those games sort of like a journal entry mm-hmm. um and just the depth of the of the journals that you can see and of the the collectible items uh, along with the retelling of these characters and bringing back this character development and all sorts of things that you were talking about with like the movies no i think what you're saying is is right it it goes deeper into the characters and you get more of this like backstory i guess yeah so uncharted 4 um tells the story of drake years after getting out of sort of this business of finding of lost artifacts Mm -hmm. um and how he falls back into it uh and why he did it in the first place and um also his like backstory and the story of his brother and all sorts of things like that yeah and uh so the sort of big push to get him back into stealing these artifacts and looking for this stuff is because he finds out that his brother who we didn't know about until this game (laughs) you know just you know happenstance um <laughs> definitely not like plot necessity yeah or anything. No. um you find out that his brother who is dead supposed to be dead was alive and that he was like i need you to help me do this heist get me money to pay back this guy so i don't get killed and he's like well i have to he doesn't tell his wife that he's going back into the business because she's like you don't need to be doing that anymore It was really bad for you and, you know, like, it was really dangerous and I don't want you being in those dangerous situations. And so he's a, it's just the story and the, the the dynamic between all of the characters, he and his wife as 
she finds out that he's gone back on another trip like this and he's put himself in danger um, and things like that, along with the dynamic of like his brother and this past and this backstory that you're getting with the brother. Um, and it's just like, yeah. And they didn't, oh, I forgot a thing. One thing they did uh, bring into the game that was new was this use of a grappling hook. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, which was not in the first three. And you can swing on this grappling hook, and it's uh, really useful in sort of, like, moving about the train, and they use it in the puzzles. Um, and it gives it just this new level of, of control over the movement in the world that is very, very pleasing mm -hmm. to, to play with. Yeah, I think the, the thing with video games or at least that i'm noticing so i don't know like the the year like the the span of like when the first one came out first uncharted to the fourth one or god of war like the span from the the first one that came out to the latest one that's come out but i think something that you're kind of talking about or kind of not really mentioning but also mentioning is like the the advancement in the technology yes which is something that you can't really see with movies i mean you can but there's not like i can't think of a, a like a a series a trilogy in movies that you see a clear distinction from like the first movie to the last movie of like this huge advancement in technology this huge advancement in like cgi or in cameras or in lighting like and i think that's something that you get with Video yeah, games. so because one big part of the video game industry is we're always advancing our tech. We're always yeah. trying to make something better. There's always a new generation of video games coming out. There's always some new advancement in like graphics cards if you're into PC gaming. But even within just the one generation of the PS4, if you look at the first games that sort of sold with the PS4 versus some of the games that we're seeing now, graphically are just insanely better. Yes. Um, this jump from the PS4 to the PS5 graphics-wise, I looked at some logistics of it. So when you're creating a layout of a world, you use, like, pixels, right? And these pixels create little triangles. And okay. these triangles are kind of what create polygons. And these polygons build the world. Okay. Right? And it, so it's this, this breakdown of things. You got pixels that build triangles that, that build, build polygons, polygons that build, build the, the world. world. Okay. Um, so... That level of graphical interface uh -huh. is, as we're getting NASA computers in our homes now. That's insane. Um, and just this, this level of, of depth and lighting where the game is in real time rendering the lighting. So typically when you load a game, the loading screen will render the lighting. Um, so the lighting is static, right? Are there are a couple of dynamic pieces in it like the character shadow say mm -hmm. um but for the most part the lighting would be static especially in older games mm -hmm. but this is all dynamic lighting completely rendered in game as you're playing so every time the game updates 60 frames per second so 60 times a second it's re-rendering all of the lighting in this entire world that oh my gosh it's pretty intense yeah, how does it have the power to do that? I mean, it just has to be, like you said, it's a NASA computer. It's just the the technology has advanced to a place where we can put that in someone's house. Yeah. In in a compact enough environment. And you're seeing all these memes of the Xbox Series X looks like a fridge. Mm -hmm. It's because that's the tech that they need to, to, to make yeah. that happen. And, and, and that's not, like the actual graphics card itself is three four inches big mm -hmm. but just the 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 advancement like we're always advancing always trying to make something graphically better or or more um fleshed out or more interactive like the ps5 dualshock is what you call a controller is going to be like this special type of of controller vibration that changes depending on how close a bullet flies to you Right, and it's specific to the side that the bullet's flying from, um, the speed and velocity of the bullet, and things like that. All nuanced things like that, all in the controller vibrating, so you can feel it and be more immersed in the game. Because the point of gaming is to bring you into this world and take you out of the the one that you're in. And I think that's something that we can have in common about what we like. I mean, movies are trying to do the same thing, but on a much 
lower scale than actually like you feeling the vibrations of a bullet whizzing <laughs> past you. But it, it's trying to bring you into that world and it's trying to be more realistic. And it, it that's the thing about both of these medias is that each new advancement is just trying to more and more imitate life. It's trying to just become more and more like reality. Yeah, and that's only one side of what you need to be doing because while you also need to find a way to imitate reality well, you also have to live the Nintendo life, which is to be artistic and creative and yeah. bring about fun and, and love these these fun, nostalgic things mm -hmm. and knowing why they're nostalgic, why they're important and continuing that sort of brand of childlike um, just wonder yeah. to this world. So like, like I just said, Nintendo does an amazing job of doing things like that with the Mario series, the Legend of the New, the New Legend of Zelda games, mm -hmm. um, it's stylized but still graphically and technologically impressive, you know. And but that's just one facet of storytelling, and that's very Nintendo brand storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, you don't see people do that other than really just Nintendo when it comes to AAA games. Because it's either I am action man who must hack and slash to get back at someone who killed someone, or it's I am depression and it's a metaphor to, for depression, or it's it's Nintendo. It's Nintendo. So stuff like the the new Red Dead Redemption, which is technologically and graphically and just gameplay wise so intricate, mm -hmm. you can literally clean your gun in uh red dead redemption 2 and there's a whole thing about cleaning your gun um there's a whole thing about taming horses and getting horses that you can hunt you can do all these things and there's so many things you can do that sort of bogs you down as a player because you don't know what to do yeah right, right. but whereas in the legend of zelda uh the breath of the wild which came out 16 i think 15 or 16 maybe 17 might have come out in 17 because that's when odyssey came out 15 came out to 17 is a great yeah. range you know <laughs> two years um but it has that same sort of vibe of explore the world and do what you want but it still feels very much linear like you have a purpose because um you're trying to defeat ganon and so you've got to do these four things you have to calm these four beasts and then i'll let you defeat ganon and games that are just so big and they don't give you that clear cut this is what you're doing sort of lose i wouldn't say interest but lose for me i guess specifically i i lose interest in that because i'm not um feeling i don't, I don't feel like there's too much for me to do and i can't decide yeah, what you, to do you get distracted yeah. by all of the different things to do and maybe sometimes lose like the correct way to go like the correct way to like yeah, advance it's, yourself it's like skyrim sort of started this trend oblivion skyrim um, which is another AAA game, um, it just started this trend of, like, giving you a billion things to do and just being like, make your own story, make your own adventure. We'll give you the things that you need. You can, And every time you play it, it's going to be different. But then in that, everyone I've ever talked to that plays Skyrim ends up becoming a stealth archer <laughs> because it's just like this is the one thing about the game that is satisfying Um and so everyone tends to lean that way and you go and do these certain specific missions. And it's like I, I very rarely will meet people that play it differently because this is just that about that game is what is satisfying. And so like if they were to lean into that in their gaming, then again, it still wouldn't it wouldn't feel the same like Skyrim vibe or same Elder Scrolls vibe. Mm -hmm. um, but th they obviously did something right there. Mm -hmm. Because that's what everyone sort of leans to. And so, like, I can get in those headshots from a mile away. <laughs> that, is, that is pure bliss. Yeah, like, you, sometimes you just get bogged down with the, with the size and scope of it. Um, I feel like that's what kind of deters me from some video games. Because you know me, I really like the, like, story-driven ones. And that's because it's a story. You know kind of where to go you know that you have yeah. something that you have to do and i feel like with other games that where they give you so many options you're just like i don't know what to do anymore can we just take a minute to talk about like movies and shows based off of video games sure 
Heck in, you can you, think you, of some, because yeah. I only think of The Witcher. <laughs> you only think of The Witcher? Uh, you if you gave me a minute, I could probably think of another um, one. Castlevania, the Netflix anime? No, I don't know. No? Well, I guess it's because I like anime, and you I like video like games. Um, so those two things kind of going into one. Not to say I don't like anime. I don't want everyone coming for me. I do like anime, just not as much as Taylor. <laughs> nah, man, I watch anime all the time. Um, but I think that the Castlevania uh, Netflix series does an amazing job of sort of blending this line of um fan service for people who enjoy the game as well as just being a good show mm -hmm. um and you know it's not i wouldn't say it's not hard to make a good anime i would say it's extremely difficult but you know you just gotta have good fight scenes good animation and then relatable and fun characters mm -hmm. um and they achieved all of that and they've got the nice backstories and it's one of those shows that you don't have to have played the video games to go into like the witcher um and well, so i mean you didn't need to play the video games for the witcher i mean i still eventually got it yeah it just, you go in just it's like going into any new movie or original like video game i guess or any kind of media where you don't know the the characters and you get to it did a good job of of getting me to learn the character and getting me to understand his backstory and where he's come from and things like that it just would have helped just a bit more having played the video games but it's not like i was completely lost the entire time but i get what you're saying it's it's yeah. good to have... to have that background yeah and it feels like you don't need this well i don't know it, it sort of definitely toes that line yeah of making video game references for people who understand the video game it makes perfect sense but then like as you continue the show and then you realize what's going on then it starts to make more sense yeah um there's but then there's also like the the set of video game movies that are just bad movies like i would say the resident evil movies not so great um never yeah. heard of them, never heard of them. They're, i think some of them are on netflix um they're really just sort of action slasher horror flicks uh that don't really oh, catch i have heard of them never mind yeah now that you said that yeah they're never um, coming to my brain the resident evil games uh were originally like horror puzzle games mm -hmm. um and you're the original resident evil you're walking around a house and uh attempting to find your friends during like a zombie outbreak in this house in this mansion and there's all these puzzles you have to solve and all these things you have to do and zombies that are trying to kill you and monsters that come out of nowhere and scare you and all that good stuff um but the general vibe is just this sense of mystery and just like fear of like what's around the corner and like why don't I know what's going on? What the heck's going on? Why are these doors <laughs> opening so slow? And all that stuff. And I think that the movies sort of draw away from that um, sort of aspect uh, that the Resident Evil just sort of grabs. And even with that being said, I think that the first couple Resident Evil, I think the first three games are extremely good. And then once you hit, like, the fourth and fifth one, are they're still considered really good, but... I wouldn't say they live up to the first three ones. The reason that those two are considered good is because they were, as technology advanced, the gameplay advanced and such and such and such and such. And then you get to like six and this sort of like slew of just shoot 'em up kind of games when Call of Duty was raking in all this money. Yeah. And so they sort of jumped on that bandwagon and these games just aren't as good. And I don't think they're developed by the same company, um, which happens a lot. Like it happened with the Batman games. Mm -hmm. So you have the first two, which was Arkham Asylum and Arkham City were released and they critically blew up amazing games. And then uh, the developer, the director of the game sort of dipped from the development company and went up to Canada and partnered with Warner Brothers Montreal and dropped Arkham Origins, which is sort of a backstory to the Batman story um sort of like his first couple years as batman and it plays this much the same but it is considered out of the the four of the games like the worst one um just because it was it was developed by a studio with less money and it wasn't as much of a passion project um because one of the big pushes for it was this multiplayer mode in which you could play as the joker or bane and batman and robin and fight against these bandits um, and it was like another shooter version where you could play as these thugs and everyone had different jobs. It was, but that was like a big push for it. And so it sort of lost this vibe of just being this amazing Batman game. And then Arkham Knight comes out and blows everything out of the water graphically, technically, 
but you you just lose this focus halfway through the series and then you come back and you realize what you needed um back to the resident evil games like six was not so great and then seven comes out a couple years later um and they sort of take a spin on it that's different and suddenly the games are huge again right now like the next one resident evil 8 is coming out on the ps5 um and it's supposed to be amazing and great and terrifying um but AAA studios oftentimes you just lose that what made the games important or the passion project in the first place and you lose sight of that and then recently a lot of studios have been coming back around and re-releasing these games and sort of catching up with like oh this didn't do so well and why not and what can we do to bring it back to basics which is sort of like a fan base thing and I wrote down on my notes like how much does the fan base uh, really affect the development of the games Mm -hmm. and i would say in circumstances like that quite a lot yeah i was gonna say they should have a a very big like impact on it because it's for them like Mm -hmm. i mean they're the ones that are going to be playing it and they should be the ones who like i mean they they know what they want i mean maybe not all not all the time (laughs) but you know what you want (laughs) yeah i know what i want Uh and i'll tell them and then they'll do it um (laughs) nah they don't know I mean, they it, don't it's, know me. They don't know me. But yeah, it's just, you know, we were talking about just losing sight of this passion of why you started this idea in the first place. And um, it, it just taking that time to come back and figure out, like, what we lost in doing that and uh, getting this cash grab and coming back and redoing it. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's a business thing. Maybe they just need to get this cash grab so that they then can create this game that everyone likes. I don't. I mean, maybe, and that you would hope. I mean, I, I could, I could genuinely see that. I could see how that would look, how that would work logistically. You have this great game that's the beautiful and all these things, and then you kind of just throw, not throw, but then you make another one that's just for money, so like you can bleed, not bleed people dry, but just make money, so then you can make another great one that you put all your passion into and again has like the best graphics and all of these things but i don't see it like that i I mean in looking at it from somebody in the the cinema world that's not what happens that's when when you make something that's great it will be made to death it will just that you put all your passion into and again again, to get money because i've never seen maybe if I, i i could do some research and i could maybe find something but what i've seen it always just comes down to greed it just comes down oh we had this great thing let's make another one to make even more money and then we'll make another one to make even more money and so but i i would love if that's how it worked and if that is how it works for some studios for some developers um i would love them to talk about it i would love to hear people saying this is what we're doing so we can do this, so we can make an even better game for you guys. But then I wonder if that would take away from it. If that would, once yeah. you told people about it, then they'd, then they'd be, be like, like, well, oh, I don't well, want to do that. if it's just for money, yeah. and I'll just wait for the next one. But then, Well, maybe if they did that and then afterwards came out and said, this is why we did that. Because maybe people would start bashing the not-so-great one. Like, if people started bashing a movie or started bashing a game saying it was just a money grabber, and then they came out with this great game, then the developers could come out later and say, like, look, we made that bad one, so you could have this great one. We made this one shit, so that this one could be nice. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. but It's I, like I having w- a third kid. <laughs> 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 you know, like, the first two, the first one's great. And you're like, we gotta do this again. So you get a second one, and the second one, not so great. And you're like, well, we made this one, so we have a standard... And now the third one, that's the one you want to see. That's the real <laughs> sequel. <laughs> Just FYI, Taylor, it's the third time. Yeah. <laughs> Not to talk myself up or anything. <laughs> For those of you who didn't get it, he's the third child. Yeah. No offense to my brothers. Brothers. Uh... But not to, this isn't just to be a bash on all corporate. We're not just like no. bashing the corporate idea. and I idea. wanted to bring that back. I wanted to say, no, 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 this isn't a bash for 
every like it, yeah. it's not a, a one shoe fits all kind of thing there are definitely some studios and some movies and i'm sure some video games out there that don't do it for the money that do it because it's completely a passion and because they love it and they make sequels because they genuinely want to add on to the original story and build mm -hmm. this world out more and it's not just a money grab and i i wanted to make sure that we stated yeah, that and as I well i think that a good example of that in the gaming industry that I can come up with would definitely be the Insomniac's Spider-Man PS4, um, which is sort of like the colloquial name, I guess. It's just labeled Spider-Man, but it was the, the recent 2018 release of Spider-Man that really just took w what the old Spider-Man PlayStation 2 games had nostalgia-wise and built upon it with these, this new technology that they had available to create this sort of... Um, brilliant game just this brilliant game mm -hmm. um and every sort of bit of the game is is littered with with comic book references with tie-ins with just just love and detail they literally built manhattan from <laughs> scratch like no joke almost street for street mm -hmm. uh and i think that in this newest one that's coming out on the PS ps5 will be street for street <laughs> it is just huge intricate beautiful fun I enticing it's got a great story um and it's just it's very much a game developed by um well i don't think insomniac was considered a triple a game studio until this game came out um and that's how big it was for that company how big it was for AAA games in general just to set this bar of what um so like the batman game set the bar of, of this is what a, a comic book video game should be like like this is what it should feel like um but it was batman so it was dark and it was gritty well whereas insomniac is taking spider-man which is light-hearted but still has those darker themes and darker tones to it and it really pushed the limits of of what a superhero video game can be mm -hmm. and now like every other superhero game that's going to come out it's going to have to live up to that expectation and so it's just you know it's exciting to see what's gonna happen in the future because of such a game changing <laughs> game change <laughs> such a game changing Slap game. My knee. <laughs> yeah um i like that you're bringing up superheroes and things like that because i had a lot of superhero things that i wanted to talk about that i'm sure we're not gonna get yeah okay maybe um, one more time but we have a little more time, maybe about 12-ish minutes before. Oh, I'm, but I had a whole thing that I wanted to go into about uh, superhero movies, but we don't need to go back into just that. Just give I us thought. the gist. I mean, it was just going to talk about Warner Brothers and the DC films and how they haven't had the best track record, especially compared to Marvel. Yeah. Um, and they just keep trying, and it's not getting better. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> well, yeah, but there's the, there's the problem, because Marvel sets the bar. Yeah. Because they came out with Captain America and Iron Man, and they were like, this is what a superhero movie should look like. Mm -hmm. And then now they push that bounds to what it can be mm -hmm. and what it can look like. And so now what people expect has to meet that expectation or higher. Mm -hmm. And so it's difficult for the DCEU um, to meet that bar because it's so high already and the expectations are so big. If if uh, Superman versus or Batman versus Superman had come out before um, Captain America: Civil War or before the like Avengers movies, I think it might have been considered much better than it was. Yeah, because they had a something to compare it to. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to just say I like that you bring up uh, superheroes because. Like, I, I do have a lot of uh, talk about that as well. But I also like how that's such a big thing in our culture nowadays. Like, it used to be, and I have this written down, that, like, people would... It was such, like, a nerd thing to do. It was kind of, like, outcast almost back in, like, the, the 70s and 80s when you would read comic books about superheroes and they were, like, nerds or, like, shunned. And now it's become, like, pop culture. It's it's cool. And, like, if you haven't seen the Marvel movies, then what are you doing? Like, you're not yeah. in the loop. Well, you, you know why? Because all the people that thought it was stupid died. <laughs> <laughs> they're all gone. Like, they're not here to say it's stupid anymore. You're now right? all the people that enjoyed it as a kid have grown up and been like, I can take this out of the closet I now. can... I yes. can live rubbing the fingers together. <laughs> just like, <laughs> it's just like, you know, as times continue to grow, like whatever's not popular now and that we, that we crap on right now, 
um, maybe that'll become a big pop culture thing, and maybe they'll look back and be like, "Ugh, those Marvel fanatics. Yeah. What was up with that? No, that's something that we were talking about that happens in the, the cinema world is that there are fads, and it, they take a while, but so uh, a new genre or a new style of movie will come out, and then eventually once it's bled to death, parodies of that will start coming out. And so there's this theory that with all of these Marvel movies and all these superhero movies, when this dies out, when there's not really much more that you can, you can't keep beating the dead horse, <laughs> <laughs> um, parodies of, are going to come out, and then something else is going to come and take its place while like people start shitting on the Marvel movies and things like, like, like you were saying. Um, but what I just wanted to say about the, the DC films, um, was the, the Batman, uh, trilogy with, um, directed by Christopher Nolan mm -hmm. and, um, Christian Bale was the, the Batman. Phenomenal movies. Phenomenal. I loved them. I, you're giving me a face and you're making me think that they weren't great. No, no, that's not what I meant. I was just, they're, they're amazing. They're great. Um, I would say the, the first one, I mean, I watched. I took a class on Christopher Nolan, so I had to watch all of them uh -huh. again recently. And in in, in rewatching them, like you pick up a little bit more every time you watch it. But it's also just that those were like it wasn't the first big superhero movie, but didn't those those came out before or around the time that the Captain America and sort of this Marvel idea was starting up. Um, and so superhero movies were relatively ambitious at that time, and. You know, taking that leap and being like, I can tell Batman's story and then telling it and it being great, mm -hmm. like, you know, blows me away a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just this, you know, I was, I was kind of hoping we could save a whole episode for superheroes and maybe we still will. Let's do it then. Let's, I won't say anymore. I won't say anymore. <laughs> Cause seriously, I have two whole pages. Two whole pages. Two whole pages. We two won't, pages. we'll save it. But yeah, I'll just finish my thought. Just that, like taking that leap and, and s being like, like I said, setting the bar, just be, be like, this is what we can do with this budget. Mm -hmm. What can you do with something better? Yeah. Um, and it's just that, that idea I think is, is, isn't prevalent enough in society is not prevalent enough because people keep coming up with crappy renditions of stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Is it> like, <laughs> we can, we can do it. It's, it's not just like, we can make it look better. It's like you need to make it be better. Yeah. You just can't just be like, well, we paid more money for it, so it's better. You have to actually put the passion behind passion. it. You have to push the, you know, we talk about passion a lot. A lot. And it's because that's the cornerstone of good media. It's when you really put your heart into it, when you're not doing it for the money, when you're doing it just because you want to make something great, that's when it's great. And, you know, where's the line at where, like, I have to do something for money so I can do something that I'm passionate about. Like, where do you draw that line, you know? And that, I think that's something that a lot of people struggle with. And it's something that I'm struggling with, wanting to go into the film industry. How do I, like, how do I make money, but I want to do what, I want to make the movies that I want to make. Um, and I think you have to start with yourself. You have to, and this is what we were talking about last week, you have to just start with what you want to do. And I think when you do what you want to do and you're passionate about what you want to do, everything's going to work out. It, it You will find a way to make money. It, it, it just happens. It just lines up with, with that when you do put in the effort. For those who try to find like shortcuts and cheap tricks and things like this, some of them may work, but I, I don't think that's how you get to your end goal those are just little things that like sidetrack you i think if you uh, do, what do you mean by like a shortcut though like doing something that's popular like making another superman movie like a cop out like a cop out yeah that's those are cheap tricks that's like make money fast scheme kind of you might make some money but that's like that's it's it's not going to do you anything. Like, it, it's just... It's not your art. It's yeah, just it's a, not your it's art. Just like, it's just a remake of somebody else's idea. It's yeah. it's a it's a cop-out. Mm -hmm. And not to say that all, like, movies like that are cop-outs. Um, I think that there are definitely, like, gems in there. I would say that The Guardians of the Galaxy, great. Yeah, great. That they're... And most of the Marvel movies are amazing, you know, mm -hmm. once they hit that sort of stride at, like, The Avengers... Um, I remember seeing the Avengers and being like, this is insane. Five <laughs> superheroes in the same movie. What? Whoa. And then like now I'm looking at Infinity War and that, that saga. And it's just, bar. and that sets the bar oh. and that, and it sets it high. High. It, it sets is it high. 
goodness. Like, where are they where are they gonna go? I want to know. I want to know. But too bad we can't know we for can't. a long time. All right, so let's sort of wrap this up. I guess this is sort of the idea we're saying with, with these sort of big. I say sort of a lot with these big AAA games and the in, in this this opportunity um, to have that budget behind your work. Uh, if you are wanting to create this media or if you're seeing this media, you need to go into it with like, w- not just we have a big budget, let's blow it on whatever. Mm-hmm. Go into it and keep that passion behind it and say, well, now that I've got the budget to back up my passion, like How what- can I use it to its fullest? Yeah, what what can I do with this with this budget, with this money- to turn my passion project into something greater, mm-hmm. you know, and, and to uh, to push the boundaries, to set the bar for the next people that are going to be making movies and games after you, that they have to meet it, Yeah, you know? Come down to just recommendations, right? Do you have anything to recommend this yeah. week? Um, I recommend Joker. I saw it five times in the theater. Yeah. Uh, I didn't get to talk about it. We're going to save it for a, hopefully a superhero, super villain um, episode. Definitely recommend. I think it's a great start if uh, the DC films, if Warner Brothers wants to start reimagining the DC universe and make it something bigger. Yeah. I would say Ghost of Tsushima. Um, it is developed by Sucker Punch. Came out 2020, I think. Came out this year. Yeah, 2020 this year. Beautiful game. Story of uh, the Mongols when they invaded Japan. And the story of a samurai who must adapt and overcome these Mongols. And increasingly, uh, and sort of just like these, these moral dilemmas behind his honor. And having to dishonor his foes and himself by... Um, doing what he has to do to take out 6,000 Mongols. Um, so much fun. Beautiful game. You can see the you can see the passion. <laughs> see the passion. Um, no, so fun. So great. Um, 10 out of 10 for me. I still haven't finished it yet, though. So I'm so, I mean, uh, God forbid I not finish a game that's 60 plus hours. I know, but how can you give your seal of approval on it? What if, like, the last half of it is, like, shit? I don't think it will be because okay. the first half of it, even if it is, the first half of it is still good it enough. It still makes up. Still for makes it. up for okay. any shit but half end. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's it for me. Okay. Are you gonna give him a kiss before we go? Or should I give him? <laughs> <laughs> oh, right at the end, right your phone goes end. off. Come on. We can just Run. cut it out right ah, after kiss. Nah, nah. Now I gotta leave it in. Okay, well, I'll see y'all next time at the end of the podcast. Bye. Bye. There you go. Media for the Intellectually Impoverished is produced by Trey Taylor Smith and Miranda Randy Zapes. Follow us on Instagram or Twitter at MFTII Podcast or email us at MFTII Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.